My name is Martin Haller. I'm a, a PhD student in physics uh, from Germany. And as a Christian and as a physicist, uh, I have to deal with several secular nar narratives on an everyday basis, essentially. And I think one of the most prevailing overarching narratives that is present in secular culture is uh, depicted uh, here on, on the title slide. Yeah, so we have the dark ages where religion is dominating and you can see the images were already quite telling for this. Uh, then at some point we have a turning point with scientific heroes that um, come out of the dark age and bring um, about a new age and turn things around. And then finally the enlightened times where light, reason and science of course dominate, uh, ushering in a new progressive era for humankind. And this is a really great narrative, I would say, and probably nobody who buys into it uh, would be easily persuaded to, uh, to study the Bible or search for God, because this would be equivalent to going bad, back to the Dark Ages, right? So yeah, just recently I have been um, exposed to one of these uh, narratives in, in my everyday experience, as I say, and I was just last year in May in a state museum in Halle with some friends. And in the state museum, um, it, it covers the pre from prehistory up to medieval ages and um, uh, middle ages and up to the enlightenment. And in the medieval times uh, rooms, they portray lots of negative parts, uh, especially concerning Christianity, of course. Um, for example, they talk about forced conversions that happen in medieval Europe uh, and so on. And the headline of these rooms was theocracy, or uh, God is ruling. And of course, this leaves you with a very negative impression of the rule of God, right? And then the final room, uh, which was about the Enlightenment, the headline of the room was Triumph of the Intellect, Verstandessieg in German. Um, so, yeah, very clearly, uh, after go going through all these rooms, uh, the fight of um, science and the intellect was with the backward Christianity that had to be overcome. This is the, the narrative that is clearly pr presented here. And I brought to you a little passage of what they wrote there. At the beginning of the early modern period in the 15th to 16th century, people began to cautiously untangle the now too narrow shackles of faith. Curiosity about the functioning of the world ultimately overcame religious bans on free thought. This paved the way to modern epistemology and spurred, for example, the development of chemistry, physics, anatomy, and pharmacy. So this is the story that is told there at the museum. And um, yeah, we will look into how we can respond to these narratives uh, from a Christian perspective. This is one of the first things uh, I want to have a look at. And then we will go through these uh, four narratives. So what is a biblical approach to these kind of stories? Um, I've brought two passages. The first one is 2 Corinthians 10. Uh, where Paul writes, For though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. And I want to highlight two important things here. Firstly, we do not fight humans. We do not fight flesh. That's not what we're fighting against, but we fight ideas. And we destroy arguments um, that come with these ideas and opinions that are raised against the knowledge of God uh, or that keep pe people from knowing God. And I would argue this example from the State Museum would be one of them. And thereby we deconstruct uh, these ideas. And in 1 Peter 3.15, uh, you can read, In your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you, yet do it with gentleness and respect. So we should be prepared to give a defense and to give reasons for our faith. Um, and we should also honor Christ as holy, and we should do this with respect when uh, uh, going in a conversation with people. And I believe this involves to say the truth and not start telling uh, narratives on our own. So this is an important thing uh, to me. Yes, so narratives that shed a bad light on the Christian faith often lead to rejection, sometimes even to demonization of the Christian faith, and pull people away from God. Yeah, this is the summary of this uh, strategy. Deconstruct and give reasons in accordance with the truth. 
All right, let's come back to this narrative uh, from the State Museum. And um, let's look at how we can deconstruct it. And um, I want to look at where this narrative of science fighting and winning over the Christian faith actually originated historically. And for this, I will mostly refer to Ronald Numbers. Uh, he's a historian of science uh, who also served as um, the president of the History of Science Society. And um, let's see what he has to say. The greatest myth in the history of science and religion holds that they have been in a state of constant conflict. No one bears more responsibility for promoting this notion than Andrew Dixon White and John William Draper. So he says this is a, actually a myth, and this is something that most historians of science would agree today. Um, and this myth was promoted by two authors with their respective books. In the case of White, A History of the Warfare of Science with Theology in Christendom, and in the case of Draper, The History of the Conflict Between Religion and Science. And these two books were international bestsellers. They were widely sold, uh, not just in the US where these two authors originated, but also all around uh, Europe. Let's have a look how Draper frames um, the story of his book in, in the preface. And he says, or writes, uh, the history of science is not a mere record of isolated discoveries. It is a narrative of the conflict of two contending powers, the expansive force of the human intellect on one side and then compression arising from traditionary faith and human interests on the other side. So this to me is really striking, essentially the same narrative that we get uh, from the State Museum. The compression from, from the traditionary faith and the expansive my, um, force of human intellect. What does the professor number say to this? He says, historians of science have known for years that White's and Graper's accounts are more propaganda than history. And these are really strong words from an historian of science, I would say, calling uh, these books propaganda. How can we debunk these narratives when we encounter them in, in a conversation? And in his book, uh, Numbers describes how the medieval church, for example, actively supported the founding of the university, which is a rather unexpected thing if you assume the narrative from the State Museum, right? So let's read what he has to say. In the medieval period, gave birth to the university, which developed with the active support of the papacy. About 30% of the medieval university curriculum covered subjects and texts concerned with the natural world. If the medieval church had intended to discourage or suppress science, it certainly made a colossal mistake in tolerating, to say nothing of supporting, the university. So Numbers himself makes a point that the narrative fails uh, as the church would have made uh, his enemy strong, so to say, right? The second point that we can uh, bring up here is that Christian doctrine actually lends ur urgency to experiment. And um, let's read what, uh, what Numbers says to this. Christian convictions also affected how nature was studied. For example, in the 16th and 17th centuries, Augustine's notion of original sin was embraced by advocates of experimental natural philosophy. As they saw it, fallen humans lacked the grace to understand the workings of the world through cogitation alone, requiring painstaking experiment and observation to arrive at knowledge of nature, uh, of knowledge, uh, at knowledge of how nature works. In this way, Christian doctrine lent urgency to the experiment. Um, and here it is also important to consider that um, the experiment is. Uh, uh, or the urgency of the experiment is not, not something that you can take for granted. As, for example, the ancient Greeks, they were not really into experimenting. They were, would much rather simply think about the world and understand it that way. So, since experimenting would be hands-on, and this is more uh, negatively for the Greeks, as this would be slave work. So, yeah, in this regard, the Christian notion of, of sin, interestingly enough, uh, helped the development of modern epistemology instead of hindering it, as uh, the State Museum narrative would have made you believe. Yeah, lastly, uh, as a third point here, let's look at how key figures of the scientific revolution uh, have viewed the Christian faith and their science. And I brought uh, three quotes here. And these quotes are, yeah, as I said, from key figures of the scientific revolution, whose findings are still valid today and taught in schools and university physics uh, courses. 
And their findings are also marked in brackets at the end of the quote. Robert Boyle writes, the most wise and powerful author of nature did at the beginning of things frame things corporal into such a system and settles among them such laws of motion as he judged suitable in making the world. And Isaac Newton writes, this most beautiful system of the sun, planets, and comets could only proceed from the counsel or dominion of an intelligent and powerful being. The key element that combines both quotes is the notion of a law of nature that is God-given. And um, some historians of science have made the argument that this notion is actually a gift from theology to uh, the natural sciences. And I can tell from my own um, experience that uh, as an experimental physicist, this is an important uh, notion to have as in lab often unexpected things happen and you really have to believe that it will all make sense in the end, right? Um, yes, the last quote I brought is from Johannes Kepler, one of my favorite physicists, I have to say. Uh, and he wrote, I wish to be a theologian for a long time. Uh, sorry, I wish to be a theologian. For a long time I was troubled, but now see how God is also praised for my work in astronomy. So really interesting, Kepler wanted to be a theologian. And now he sees how through his science and um, through showing the people how uh, the world is ordered, um, making them see how beautifully God made the universe. Uh, and this was an act of worship and praise to him. This is a really harmonic view of his science and faith putting, uh, being put together here. So I think we can conclude that the, these key figures of the scientific revolution were definitely not at all shackled by their faith, uh, but rather motivated to do the science. All right, I would say let's move on to um, the next narrative. Medieval Christians taught a flat earth. Maybe some of you have encountered it as well. And uh, this is a narrative that circulates to this day, and um, especially that they taught flat earth uh, based on the Bible, extracting this belief uh, from the Bible, and thereby uh, Christians, and especially medieval Christians, are painted as backward and ignorant uh, towards scientific progress. And one of the examples given to demonstrate the flat earth belief in medieval times is this engraving called Flammarion's engraving. Um, you can see this flat earth here with uh, some churches and uh, like a neat little medieval uh, landscape. And the sky is spanned on top of it like a, like a dome. And you see this wanderer here that uh, is looking through the, uh, the dome and risks to fall off the earth. So this is how uh, people would tell the, uh, or people would believe that uh, medieval people pictured um, the world. And during an excursion with my colleagues, uh, we went into a museum at uh, Magdeburg in Germany. And this museum was covering the history of science. And at some point, uh, we had a guide there uh, he told us that the church did not acknowledge the sphericity of the earth until 1980s. And uh, this, is of, of course, is not true. And when I protested, he became really emotional. Um, and it was not possible to discuss this any, any further, actually. Uh, yet this is nonsense that people believed in a flat earth. And the sphericity was actually um, common knowledge since ancient Greece. The Greeks already had arguments uh, for uh, round earth. And uh, the church did accept that. They, they had no uh, problem with that whatsoever. However, even my colleagues um, told me that they have been told this in school uh, through the school books, which often feature this uh, engraving as well as an authentic um, example for the medieval worldview. And actually one um, uh, a professor for the didactics of history of Vienna has worked out that this is in part still printed today in school books. So this is a widespread narrative that is taught in school. Yeah, this myth has also been popularized by White, one of the two authors that I presented to you in the beginning. And let's read how he frames the story. The warfare of Columbus and the world knows well. How wise men of Spain confronted him with the usual quotations from the Psalms, from St. Paul and from St. Augustine. How even after he was triumphant and after his voyage had greatly strengthened the theory of the Earth's sphericity, 
the church by its highest authority solemnly stumbled and persisted in going astray. So the wise men he is referring to here are the, uh, from the University of Salamanca. This was like an elite uh, university in Spain of the time. And you can see in this depiction here, the wise men discussing uh, with Christopher Columbus. According to the narrative of White, uh, the, the wise men warned him that his voyage is impossible due to the flat earth. And um, yeah, they were only, uh, mostly quoting the Bible and the church fathers. And even after Columbus succeeded his voyage, um, proving the sphericity of the earth, uh, they were totally ignorant and not accepting his demonstration uh, of that. That is the narrative. And in the painting, you can also see this very determined Columbus and the critically uh, critical um, looking uh, clerics uh, on the other side. Yeah, let's see what Professor Numbers has to say to this narrative. He writes, uh, popular accounts continue to circulate the erroneous story that Columbus fought the prejudice and ignorant scholars and clerics. The learned men were aware of the current debates about the size of the earth, and they used its sphericity in their arguments against Columbus, arguing that the round earth was larger than Columbus claimed, and that a circumnavigation would take too long to complete. So the flat earth was actually no, at no part uh, was no part of the discussion with, uh, of Columbus and the wise men at all. Uh, it was simply about the size of the earth and the distance of his voyage. And they told him that he has miscalculated the distance of the voyage and he would not be able to make it and uh, probably be stuck in the ocean somewhere. Uh, however, he did it anyway and happened to stumble on a continent that nobody knew was there before. Um, Yet we have to really say that the round shape of the earth was by no means uh, in discussion uh, here at any time. It's simply a myth that was invented dur during the enlightenment by an author called, uh, author called Washington Irving, uh, who wrote a um, fictionalized biography about Columbus, but it was cited again and again uh, afterwards. Yes, coming back to this engraving, Flammarion's engraving, that is used in school textbooks. This image was considered authentic during the 20th century, also by historians, uh, but it was exposed to be a forgery uh, from 1888, actually. And this is really shocking, I think, uh, considering how many generations have been taught that this is an authentic medieval uh, worldview depiction, right? Now, one might ask a question, uh, how, how and why does the story live for so long if it's um, totally incorrect. And uh, this picture here was actually part of a newspaper ar article that I read in a, a German newspaper titled The Arrogance of the Present. And I think the perspective of the author here is pretty interesting and I'd like to, uh, to, to share it with you. Uh, and the author writes, why do we stick so strongly to this notion? The narrative of our ancestors believing in the flat earth is still so popular due to the narrative of progress. We appear much smarter and developed than our naive ancestors. Our own arrogance hinders us from viewing the past truthfully. We need the depiction of the dark Middle Ages to paint our modern world as the bright one in contrast. It is simply a good story. So the main point being is it's a good narrative. That's why it keeps alive for so long. And probably I could agree with that, but still it's a wrong narrative. But this just shows how powerful narratives can be. Yeah, what can we use as a takeaway for a conversation? And uh, I think easy graphical uh, examples are good here. So here on the left side, you can see the imperial in insignia of German emperors. That's around 1200. And you can see this globe, um, where, and on the globe rests this cross. And this was given to the German emperors to symbolize their worldly power, but still Christ reigns supreme on top, right? So if they would have believed in the flat earth, they could have um, saved lots of gold and money by simply putting it flat, right? So I think this is a, a good point here. Here on the right, you can see a painting from Gustave de Metz. He was a French uh, monk in the 13th uh, century. I'm missing a letter here. And uh, you can see here the uh, round earth with soldiers wandering on top. And here in the bottom, you can see they also wander on the bottom side and nobody's falling off the edge. 
So I think this is pretty clear uh, evidence that people were not believing in a flat Earth. But yeah, I would suggest to, to move on to the next narrative, which is also a prime example for uh, the hostility of the Christian faith against scientific progress. Yeah, in this image you can see uh, Galileo Galilei in front of the Roman Inquisition being condemned for his revolutionary science, as the narrative would say. And you can see a seemingly angry cleric that points on a decree and Galilei with a very determined facial express expression that's uh, opposing them. Um, yeah, I would say this is probably the most iconic story. And when discussing with people, they simply just need to say Galilei and then everybody knows, ah, oh, yeah, there is this uh, fight between science and uh, religion. Um, yeah, this narrative is also found in Draper's book, as we can read here. And he writes, many beautiful dis telescopic discoveries by Galilei tended to the establishment of the truth of the Copernican theory and gave unbounded alarm to the church. By the low and ignorant ecclesiastics, they were denounced as deceptions or frauds. He was then committed to prison, treated with remorseless severity during the remaining 10 years of his life. And I think it's really telling that in this account, he calls the ecclesiastics low and ignorant um, and I think it clearly shows his agenda with uh, the use of these adjectives. Um, but to better understand the context, uh, let me explain what the Copernican theory is and how it is different from the previous world system. So first on the left side, you see the Ptolemaic uh, system. In the center, you see a spherical Earth uh, that is stationary and in the center uh, and is not rotating. And the sun orbits around the Earth. So this is the system that has been accepted since ancient Greece. Ptolemy was an ancient Greek uh, um, astronomer and has also widely been taught throughout Christian Europe. Now Copernicus uh, proposed a new system several decades before uh, the whole story with Galileo began. And uh, in his system uh, that you can see on the right here, the sun is in the center and the earth now orbits around the sun and the earth is now also rotating. Uh, essentially, essentially, he switched uh, the sun and the earth here. Okay, so that's that's the context. And I want to have a look at uh, how an historian of astronomy would put the story of uh, Galilei uh, together. Um, in 1543, Copernicus' uh, system is published in, in his book. And actually, it was already utilized by the church to calculate the Easter date more accurately. Um, the church had no issue with it back then, as it was used as an hypothesis simply for doing um, more efficient calculations, let's say. Then in 1610 and 13, uh, Galilei um, mastered the newly invented telescope and made uh, some observation. For example, he saw the satellites of Jupiter, he found mountains on the moon, and uh, this increased the plausibility of the uh, Copernican system. However, after these publications, he came into a fight and argued with uh, philosophers and theologians who claimed that uh, his system is incompatible with scripture. And this became somewhat heated, so he uh, went to Rome in 1616 uh, to settle this dispute. But instead, uh, the book of Copernicus is um, banned there, and discussion about it is forbidden until the book is uh, revised. Then in 1623, a friend of Galilei becomes Pope, Urban VIII, and he assures Gal uh, Galilei that the Copernican system can be uh, discussed if it's viewed as a hypothesis, not as a physical fact, but as an hypothesis. And then a few years later, Galilei prints uh, a famous book, uh, which is called a Dialogue, uh, in which uh, a figure that's called Simplicissimo, which means the simple man, or maybe the stupid man even, um, and this person defends the Ptolemaic system. And uh, he is ridiculing the defenders of that system, uh, which is also the Pope. And he also violates the decree of 1616, where he was not supposed to discuss this in, in that way again. And then um, the things happen that probably most people know of. He is interrogated and condemned by the Inquisition for the suspicion of heresy. And he has to spend uh, his last years in house arrest in his villa near Florence. So he was not tortured or imprisoned as uh, we have read in the beginning. A few years later, Galilei uh, then dies. How can we debunk this uh, narrative? 
Um, and I think the, the cool question uh, that we have to answer here is, uh, were the observations of Galilei um, and the knowledge of the time sufficient evidence to, uh, for the Copernican system? And the actual answer is no. There were several physical objections still present at the time. Uh, one, for example, was if the Earth moves, why aren't the clouds blown away? If it moves in the universe, it, there, people would assume there's an air stream that blows uh, the clouds away. That's what that was not observed. Then also, if the Earth rotates, why wouldn't falling objects stay behind the Earth's rotation? For example, if I drop this pen, people would have expected it to go like this because the Earth is rotating away underneath uh, the pen. Um, nowadays, we don't have issues with these questions because we have the new physics of Isaac Newton, but back then, uh, it was like uh, 50 years uh, prior to that, these were valid open questions. In addition, there was an astronomical objection, which is the uh, missing parallax of closed stars, and I tried to sketch it here on the right side. So in the Copernican system, we have the sun in the center and the Earth orbiting around it. And at one point in the year, the Earth would be at this point. And if we look at a star that's kind of close to Earth um, uh, versus the, the reference point, which is these six stars, we would see uh, this here on the night sky, this fixed star on the position one, it's a projection on this plane. Then half a year later, the Earth would have been moving uh, over here. And then we would see the same star over there. So over the course of the year, you would expect to see closed stars moving a little bit. And this was should have been measurable, but it was not. Uh, this has just been measurable uh, in 1838, so almost 200 years uh, after the discussion uh, with Galilee. Yeah, takeaways uh, from for a conversation. Uh, the scientific evidence at the time was not sufficient for the new system, uh, even though Galileo was correct in the, uh, in the end. But at the time, you could not make a definitive judgment. And uh, the church took the standpoint of the majority of scientists at that time. And uh, also a quote from the astronomer where it took, uh, uh, took, took the, the data from. Uh, he says to the story, we have to understand that the common view of Galileo was produced by 18th century science propaganda. So again, pretty strong words to the common narrative uh, that we find in, in our popular culture. Christianity supports slavery. And I stumbled uh, upon this um, um, and on an article from the Humanist Press Service, as I indicated here. And they had this article entitled Church and Slave Trade, a Reluctantly Heard Story. And this Humanist Press Service is um, the largest humanist news website in Germany, and they claim to have over 10,000 visitors uh, per day, so rather influential when it comes, um, uh, comes to this. And two, uh, I cannot read the whole article here, but two points that are making is that two papal bulls of the 15th century allowed the Portuguese to conquer and put non-Christian people to, to servitude, and that uh, these bulls were used as a um, legitimization for the transatlantic uh, slave trade. And also then uh, later on in the article, they also claimed that the Bible supports these papal rulings, um, quoting mostly from uh, Old Testament uh, passages. Yeah, so firstly, uh, we have to acknowledge here that they have a point that Christians have been involved in slavery and the slave trade, and we should not... Um, um, we should acknowledge that and also apologize for that where, where it's really necessary. Um, but I want to point out that in this article, it really, uh, the story that they tell here really seems like um, to be a very one-sided narrative and gives you the impression that the church originated the slave trade in some sense um, with these bulls and the Bible was essentially uh, responsible for it. And just in recent years, uh, the church came to oppose it due to experimental pressure. That's kind of the, the idea you get after reading this, this article. Yeah, so first I want to have a look um, why the Bible does not support slavery. And secondly, I want to uh, have a look what historians say about slavery was abolished and what the driving forces uh, for that were. Yeah, so around the time when Jesus walked the earth, uh, slavery was an elementary part of Roman society. 
75% uh, of Athens and 50% of Rome's populations were slaves. And uh, therefore we can find uh, several scriptures that address the topic. The first uh, scripture I brought you is Galatians 3. And there it says, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free. There is no male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. I would say there is no difference between slaves and free people, also between male and female. I think a pretty, uh, pretty strong um, scripture considering the context of the Roman times. Then there's also the book of Philemon, a really small one, uh, which also has a really interesting story in it. In it. Uh, Paul urges Philemon to take back uh, Onesimus, um, who was his slave, but ran away. Uh, and now he writes to Philemon, uh, I appeal to you for my child Onesimus. I prefer to do nothing without your consent in order that your goodness might not be by compulsion, but of your own accord, that you might have him back forever, no longer as a bondservant, but more than a bondservant, as a beloved brother. So if you consider me your partner, receive him as you would receive me. So Paul urges Philemon um, to take him back as a brother in Christ and as if Paul himself, one of the major leaders of the early church, would come to him, which would be surely not as, as a slave, right? So this is essentially an appeal to set uh, Onesimus uh, free. And in First Timothy, uh, we find uh, condemnation of enslavers, actually. And it reads that the law is not laid down for the just, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and sinners, enslavers, liars, perjurers, and whatever else is contrary to sound doctrine. So enslavers are called ungodly and sinners and acting as um, contrary to sound doctrine. So I would argue this is far from supporting slavery or the slave trade. Um, now let's see what, uh, what was the motivation of the abolition movement. And for this, I brought a quote from the historian John Dixon's book, Bullies and Saints. He writes the following. The leaders of the modern abolition movements were often outspoken Christians with overtly religious arguments. Abolitionism was not a secular movement. There was religion on both sides, to be sure. The difference is, the arguments against slavery were almost entirely religious or quasi-religious, whereas the arguments for slavery were economic, scientific, and pragmatic, as well as religious. And one of the arguments uh, that was uh, often brought forward is what he describes here. The preeminent American authority on slavery, David Bryan Davis, Sterling Professor of History at Yale University, titled his sweeping history of the subject in the image of God, Energy points out that the popular hostility to slavery drew on traditions of natural law and a revivified sense of the image of God in man. So one of the major arguments used against slavery throughout history, as it was also used in the early church, is that all men are created in the image of God, irrespective of race and whatever you can imagine. One Christian who was particularly, um, yeah, let's say, uh, a key figure in the fight against slavery is William Wilberforce. And uh, he was a British evangelical Christian uh, who wanted to influence society for the better as a politician and a Christian. And uh, he wrote in his diary, God Almighty has set before me two great objects, the suppression of the slave trade and the reformation of manners. So he saw himself as given the task from God to suppress the slave trade. And he did this throughout his political career in the British Parliament as, an, um, as a member there. And one of his, in one of his speeches, he said, I confess to you so enormous, so dreadful, so irremediable did this wickedness appear that my own mind was completely made up for abolition. Let the consequences be what they would. I from this time determined that I would never rest until I had effected its abolition. And so the wickedness and dreadfulness of slavery was so severe to him uh, that he would push abolition no matter the consequences and the consequences uh, were significant, actually, and especially uh, economically. Uh, William Wilberforce submitted in 1823 a petition to the British Parliament to for the abolition of slavery, and uh, it took 10 years for it to pass. And in 1833, the Slavery Abolition Act 
uh, is passed, banning slavery in many, uh, many British colonies and also later on in all colonies. And this abolition act saw the British government take a loan of 20 million uh, British pounds sterling for buying freedom of 700,000 uh, slaves. And there are estimates that this is, would be roughly equivalent to 30%, 40% of the total annual expenditure of the British government uh, at that time. So it was a major economic um, uh, yeah, endeavor. What can be the takeaways here? Um, I think we can point to the scriptures that clearly oppose slavery, uh, which I covered, and uh, especially that the main argument for the abolition of slavery was uh, the image of God, that all humans are created in the image of God. And lastly, we can point to the example of William Wilberforce, which is also easily findable if you Google for him, and also in the context of his um, abolition uh, yeah, work. Uh, as an evangelical Christian and a staunch opponent of slavery, and he was really a key figure for ending slavery. 